Welcome to the Accelerant Podcast. An accelerant is a substance used to aid the spread of fire. This podcast aims to accelerate the fires of faith, hope, and love as our world descends increasingly into the depths of fear, despair, and hate. As totalitarian trends and divide and conquer strategies from the rich and powerful threaten the freedoms we used to take for granted, as deception proliferates, lawlessness spreads, and the love of many grows cold, as history careens towards its ultimate climax and the Bride of Christ begins to anticipate the return of Jesus, our Bridegroom King, to establish His everlasting kingdom here on earth in fullness as it is in heaven, my aim is that by giving intentional focus and airtime to the things that truly matter most, through biblical teaching, Holy Spirit revelation, unpacking the unique dynamics we can anticipate in the generation in which the Lord returns, exploring promises yet to be fulfilled by the God who cannot lie, and by telling stories of genuine encounter with Jesus, the darling of heaven, in both my own experience and through the experiences of a variety of interesting guests we'll have on the show, I want to pour accelerant on the fires of your faith even if they be but dwindling embers, igniting flaming beacons of hope and raising up a worldwide company of burning and shining lamps, blazing with a robust and unmovable love that astounds and provokes a watching world. Isaiah 60 tells us to arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the peoples, but the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Truly, the light shines brightest in the darkness. As we experience what it's like to inhabit the earth when everything that can be shaken is shaken, know this, faith, hope, and love will endure and carry us through when everything else crumbles and fades away. Join us every Wednesday as we explore these themes on the Accelerant Podcast. I am your host, Jason Kelly. Hello and welcome to episode six of the Accelerant Podcast. I'm Jason Kelly, your host. And this week, as I've been hinting at, I'm going to be looking at the signs of the end of the age and uh, something the Bible describes as the great and terrible day of the Lord. Uh, there are some aspects of the end of the age and that final generation that are going to be incredibly great. And I want to look at those. But we have to be honest about what the scriptures describe about the day of the Lord. There is a dreadful aspect. There is a terrible aspect to that as well. And so uh, we are prone to get, uh, we would be easily offended if we don't understand the warnings in the scripture about what the climax of history is going to be like. And many will be offended and will leave the faith because they don't understand what God is up to. Um, I'm going to start this episode off by reading a couple pages out of the next chapter of my book called I Hope Therefore I Am. And this chapter is called A Coming Worldwide Change in the Understanding and Expression of Christianity Before the Great and Terrible Day of the Lord. Um, in episode one, I go into uh, just kind of talking, uh, sharing without reading the book, um, basically a summary of where I'm going in this chapter. So I don't know that I'll read the whole chapter, but I, I feel like this first chapter, a uh, couple pages of the chapter will lay out some things for us and then we can, um, I'll come back and we'll, we'll examine some of these uh, realities, some of these scriptures in more detail. So um, here we go. Chapter 2, A Coming Worldwide Change in the under Understanding and Expression of Christianity Before the Great and Terrible Day of the Lord. In order to unpack this chapter title, I intend to make my argument primarily from Scripture, but I feel it relevant and helpful to also share a bit of my own spiritual journey and prophetic history and how that dovetails with some of the prophetic history and spiritual revelations pertaining to biblical promises given to Mike Bickle of the Inter International House of Prayer as a confirmation of this conviction that God is going to do something dramatic for the body of Christ before Jesus returns to establish his kingdom, something I'm growing convinced is sooner than many think, perhaps even within the next 10 to 15 years. I'm writing this almost two years into the despair-inducing backdrop of the COVID-1984 scamdemic launched in 2020. 
The rapid pace at which global authoritarianism through the cleverly crafted means of medical tyranny has been accelerated has left many freedom lovers, dreamers, and visionaries paralyzed as our loudest protests, our most courageous whistleblowers, and our most articulate counter-narrative voices have been suppressed, ignored, and ridiculed in the public square. But in this in this context, when the enemy's dark agenda seems so relentless and insurmountable, I am of the conviction that 2022 will be a time of heavenly invasion, the launch of a spiritual awakening that will outshine every revival in church history past. I'll share more about my hunches on that in due time. This is a book about the utter necessity and power of hope. It is also a book about how to anchor ourselves in this hope, how to strategically incorporate this hope into our lives, and how to spread this hope to others in these critical times. Now, biblically, our hope ultimately rests in the glorious return of Christ our Savior. But the years leading up to that day will be both great and terrible, Joel 2.11. And as such, the need for hope will be both great and terrible. Great for those who lay hold of it, and terrible for those who don't. It will be terrible in that it will be a time of universal shaking, Haggai 2.6 and 7, Hebrews 12.26-29, Matthew 24.7. A time of ethnic and political strife and conflict, a time of wars and rumors of wars, Matthew 24.7. A time of great fear, Luke 21.26. A time of various pestilences, Matthew 24.7. A time of famine food scarcity and hyperinflation, Revelation 6, chapter, verse 5 and 6, a time of universal persecution, a, a betrayal, lawlessness, deception, and fake news, false prophets, false messiahs, and counterfeit miracles, a time of idolatry, murder, theft, immorality, and sorcery, Revelation 9, 20 through 21, a time of a great falling away, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, a time of global Luciferian tyranny, Revelation 13, a time when sin and rebellion will have reached its fullness, Daniel 8.23, and a time of judgment leading to the outpouring of God's much-deserved wrath, Revelation chapter 6-22. through 22. But it will also be a time of greatness, a time of a great spiritual awakening, a time of great spiritual outpouring, Acts 2.17-21, Joel 2, 28-32, a time of great miracles, John 14, 12, Micah 7, 15, increased frequency and accuracy of prophecy, dreams, and visions, a time of great harvest, Matthew 13, Revelation 14, a time of the fulfillment of the Great Commission, Matthew 24, 14, 28, and chapter 28, verse 18 through 20. A time of great unity, John 17, 20 through 26, Ephesians 4, 13. A time of great intimacy, Ephesians 4, 13, Daniel 11, 32 and 33, Matthew 25, 1 through 13. A time of great maturity, Ephesians 4, 13, 5, 26, Revelation 19, 7. A time that the body of Christ steps into great authority by living out the great commandments, Deuteronomy 6, Matthew 22. A time of a great throng of prayer and worship, Isaiah 42, 10 through 13, Malachi 1, 11. Revelation 22, 17, Luke 18, 1 through 18. For the greatness of his name unto our great and glorious hope, the greatest transition in human history, when our great Savior splits the sky, confronts the Antichrist and the wicked kings of the earth in concert with him, drives wickedness off the planet, secures justice and righteousness for mankind, swallows death once and for all, and establishes his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, bringing all things in heaven and on earth under his lordship. Ephesians 1.11 us his bride, ruling and reigning with him forever and ever as a kingdom of priests. Revelation 5, 9 and 10. Let me reiterate, ultimately my hope rests in nothing less than the return of Jesus. But if I am to make it till that day, or even till the end of my day, should I not live to see that day without losing heart, then my confidence must be unshakable, that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Psalm twenty seven thirteen. I am writing this chapter to stir faith, hope, and love in the bride of Christ who will have made herself ready by the time this whole thing is said and done. Jesus will have an equally yoked bride. She will be one as Jesus and the Father are one so that a watching world will see and believe God sent his Son for our redemption. She will be walking in greater works than Jesus demonstrated in his first coming. She will be in unity with the Holy Spirit crying out for Jesus to return. But Jesus was a realist and wanted us forewarned so that we would not be offended, caught off guard, and unprepared when the world in which the reviving bride resides is shaken to its core unlike any time in human history. 
Why will God allow such a shaking? Because he will use the least severe means to remove everything that hinders love. He will use uh, the least severe measures to reach the greatest number of people at the deepest levels of love without violating anyone's free will. The least severe measures will actually be the most jarring time in human history, and Jesus alone is worthy to orchestrate such a scenario. Revelation 5. He will allow righteousness and wickedness to blossom to maturity before the great harvest. That means he will allow wicked tyrants to oppress the masses in order to position us for the greatest harvest of souls as to date and to usher the church into the greatest levels of maturity unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In order to attain this, we, as the one who we worship and follow, will have to go the way of the cross. Widespread martyrdom and persecution is an undeniable theme in the many end-time passages of Scripture. Daniel 7, 21, 25, 8, 24, 11, 33 through 35, Matthew 24, 9, Revelation 6, 9 through 11, 12, 11, 13 through 17, 13, 7 and 10, 17, 6, 18, 24, 19, 2, 20, verse 4 albeit only 3% of what the book of Revelation is about. As much as I'd love to believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, there's too many passages in Scripture that state clearly we will be here, and many will get to obtain a martyr's crown through suffering for their testimony of Jesus. But by denying ourselves and laying down our lives, we overcome the accuser of our souls, Revelation 12.11, and we will come to know the genuine power of resurrection, Philippians 3, 10 and 11 as the author and perfecter of our faith brings the greatest story ever told to its dramatic and climactic conclusion. Spoiler alert, there's a happy ending, a glorious ending. The knowledge of the glory of the Lord shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church that Christ is building. To the point, Jesus wins. He will have the nations for his inheritance. The meek shall inherit the earth. All Israel shall be saved. His kingdom will come and his will shall be done on earth as it is in heaven. The eternal kingdom Daniel saw in a vision shall be given to the Son of Man, and his saints shall reign with him forever, and eventually he shall make all things new, a new heaven and a new earth. But buckle your seats. It's going to be a wild ride getting there, and hope will be an indispensable ingredient as we journey into exploring our identities as more than conquerors and the apple of his eye. I'm going to stop there. Um, I brought up several things that are worth taking our time to, to look at a little closer and, and to go through. Um, he, he, I, I don't know, I didn't mention this, but it'll be a time of great deception. Jesus said in Matthew 24, when his disciples asked, hey, uh, you talked about this temple being destroyed. When's that going to happen? And tell us about the signs of uh, the uh, of your return and of the end of the age. And Jesus, um, the first thing he says to them is, says, watch out that no one deceives you. We will be living in an age of deception. And I don't know about you, but um, I've caught the news media and many, many lies, propaganda, and deceptions. And uh, not only that, but there will be many coming in his name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. Now, throughout history, we've had different cult leaders that have, you know, the Jim Joneses and the um, different ones that have uh, claimed to be Messiah. But I don't think that we're at the fullness of this yet. I think we're going to see a ramp up of false Christ coming on the scene in the days ahead. He says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. That's an interesting phrase, rumors of wars. Uh, I don't know if that speaks of the Cold War, um, but even with this uh, Russia-Ukraine hostility going on, uh, you know, I find it really fascinating how quickly uh, the masses are manipulated by propaganda. In every great war, there's war propaganda. And Um, and and I, I have not picked sides in this battle. I don't know enough to be able to speak intelligently into what's really going on, but I know that, uh, our government is not blameless. The, 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 um, governments of the West and NATO, um, have been doing things intentionally behind the scenes, uh, for many years to 
provoke hostility. And there are warmongers out there that want to uh, make a racket on war. And there have been people through history who have uh, actually uh, started wars and uh, given um, armaments to both sides of a war. Um, there are people out there who believe in that the, there's too many people on the planet. And so they're happy to contribute to uh, culling the size of the human population. And war is a great way to do that. War is also a great way to um, to advance agendas in a, in a way uh, when people are gripped with fear and are in place of desperation, they will willingly give up their rights. They will uh, be okay with more dramatic change. And after World War I, we saw the League of Nations. After World War II, we saw the United Nations come into being. And these are all precursors to a, what the Bible describes as a 10-nation confederation that will be formed. And I'm not going to go too deep into that, but it talks about that in Revelation and in the book of Daniel. And, um, and, and we don't see that yet. Uh, it's not clear that who and what nations are involved in that. But that has to happen before uh, Jesus can return and the Antichrist can come on the scene. And so um, war is a great way to change boundary lines and reconfigure alliances. And, um, you know, um, Bob Jones, I mentioned him, I think it was in 1975, he had a death experience and, um, he saw, uh, he, he saw many things about the future and he overheard two angels talking and, um, they talked about, uh, this 24 seven prayer reality that would come up, um, all over the earth. And, um, he was given specific details about a um, particular expression of that in, in the heart of America in Kansas city. And, um, he was shown that there would be uh, a time where what he thought he saw a nuclear explosion, but it was described. He described it as the second Adam's balm B A L M. And it looked like, a, a, you know, a, a negative thing, but it was a, a positive explosion of divine light that would, in an, in a second go all the way around the world. And, um, there would be incredible healings and miracles and, and the power of God and, um, God's blessing would rest on the Midwest, uh, in a 500 mile radius around Kansas city. And, um, you know, this is just a promises specific to that ministry, but, um, it really has to do with the whole body of Christ. And there's going to be expressions, um, where God, uh, blesses those that have, believed his word and given themselves to night and day prayer all over the earth. And so you don't have to worry that you're not in Kansas City when this happens. Um, but he was seen that he was shown that 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 area there would be a time of famine and a time of war. They they said that World War Three is coming, and so this place would be like a city of refuge. But and in, in this time of famine, there would be um, a, a bread basket out of the Midwest that would be both providing uh, food in the natural and in the spirit for many around the globe. Um, and so uh, he was tipped off that this world war was coming. And as we read um, Matthew 24 and Revelation 6, we see uh, a time of global conflict on the horizon. And I know that's not happy news, but Jesus said these things must come to pass. He, he says, see that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. He says, there'll be famines and earthquakes in various places. These are the beginning of birth pangs. So uh, when we begin to see these things, now I know people have dismissed this. There's been wars all throughout history. Um, but I believe there's going to be an increase of this kind of thing in the final years leading up to his return. Um, it uh, says that there will be a time, oh, and the rumors of wars, is an interesting phrase because, um, you know, I I, uh, I don't quite buy the narrative that the media is telling us um, about what's going on uh, over there. Our own government is involved in all kinds of corruption in the Ukraine, um, and uh, I I really don't have enough information to know whether Putin is as evil as Hitler as they're claiming he is. Um, and if you don't join the bandwagon and hate him with vitriol, um, it, with as much hatred as you should have had for Hitler, then, um, then you're a traitor and, um, 
you know, a water boy for Putin. Um, yeah, there are. It's much more complicated and nuanced than we would be led to believe. I believe, uh, but. I, I, you know, I'm not here to try to defend one position about this conflict. What I am here to say is my antenna are up as the rumbling. Never have I heard on the lips of so many people talking about the possibility of World War III launching imminently. And, um, you know, I think there are people behind the scenes in partnership with the devil um, getting the world ready for conflict. Um, it says it'll be a time of great fear, Luke 21, 26. People's uh, hearts will be failing because of the fearful things coming on the earth. Uh, a, a time of pestilences. Uh, you know, this pandemic is just uh, one form, and there's variants of this, um, uh, uh, of the coronavirus. Um, but uh, we're warned that there will be times of pestilence and pestilences, plural. So, um Unfortunately, I think that we can uh, prepare ourselves for more of that. A time of famine, food scarcity, and hyperinflation. In Revelation 6, I think it's the third um, seal is broken, and a, a, a horse, which color horse is that? I, he goes out and he, and he says some things that at first reading don't make immediate sense, but um, it's basically talking about um, uh, an economic uh, upheaval where... Uh, you know, basic foods for our sustenance are highly expensive, but that the the finer things are are preserved, and um, and and I think it speaks of a time of hyperinflation. Uh, it goes on to say that there will be uh, worldwide persecution that will be hated in all nations because of him. And that is uh, something that we have not had to taste in the, in the West. We've had religious freedom. Um, maybe we get mocked and ridiculed in the media. Uh, but uh, the time will come where every nation will get to experience what places like China and um, places in the Middle East where you are, are killed for your faith. Um, and that's something that, uh, you know, I don't know... How many people are going to experience this? Um, you know, the fifth seal in Revelation 6 is the martyrs crying out, when will their blood be avenged? And, um, and there, the angel tells John that, it, um, and tells these martyrs, um, they have to wait until the, the full number of those who are uh, preordained to be martyred uh, comes, comes to its quota. And so I don't know what that number is, and I don't know how widespread it will be. I do know this, that only 3% of the book of Revelation speaks about martyrdom, and we make it a bigger deal than it is. But um, if that is our fate, we have uh, no reason to fear. We have been promised eternal life. And and uh, once we step away from this life into the age to come, um, we, we are nothing but unadulterated glory and the the beauty of the Lord and the presence of the Lord and the love will envelop us. And so we have nothing to fear, but fear itself. Um, it goes on to describe a time of great betrayal. And um, let's see, I'm flipping around here. Uh, that is something I've already seen. Um, people are turning on one another because of different convictions about, uh, you know, are we buying the media narrative or are we doing our own research and, and thinking critically about these things. But if you uh, don't land where um, the mainstream narrative wants you to land, you get ostracized and you get, um, uh, you know, put in a, in a category that you're a domestic terrorist or you're a walking biohazard. And so I can see um, already sort of the precursor to a culture of betrayal, the, the cancel culture. Um, I mean, goodness, you know, they won't allow uh, certain mustards to be sold because they're from the country of Russia. Um, just the cancellation of an entire nation. Um, now, I will say this. Putin is uh, supposedly, according to Klaus Schwab, a uh, young global leader in the World Economic Forum um, ilk. And, and uh, I think he 
lines up with uh, agendas that I don't agree with. And so uh, I'm not for one side or the other. I do think that there are, you know, all the world's a stage and we are merely actors. And I think that there are people who are playing their part and they know that it's a part that will help um, progress the world towards um, what the Bible describes as a one world government. And um, there are many outspoken people in the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, the Trilateral Commission, uh, the Bilderberg Group, the um, World Economic Forum, that want to push for a one world government. Um, we're, we're told that because of the increase of lawlessness, the hearts of many will grow cold, Matthew 24, 12. Um, we, we see these trends towards uh, defunding the police. And when you do that, um, crime escalates in, in inner cities because no one wants to be a cop anymore. It's just a thankless job. And there's not the funding to uh, deal with the, the crime issues. Um, we see it's a time of deception and fake news, a time of false prophets, false messiah, counterfeit miracles. That's going to be interesting to see. Uh, people are blown away when the miraculous happens. And just because something that seems of a supernatural nature happens, it does not necessarily mean that that's the Lord. You you need to uh, look at the message of the miracle worker and see that it lines up with the message of the gospel. Uh, in Revelation 9, 20 through 21, um, we see these uh, four major strongholds uh, in operation in the general public of idolatry, of murder, theft, and immorality, and sorcery. Um, and in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, uh, we see a great falling away, a time of uh, global Luciferian tyranny, Revelation 13, um, in a time when sin and rebellion will reach its fullness. In Matthew 13, Jesus told a parable about um, someone who sowed seed in a field, and and then weeds grew up. And someone said, hey, should we, um, you know, remove these weeds? And he said, no, let them grow together. And then at the end, um, there, there would be a harvest and the wheat and the wheat, the wheat and the tares would be separated. And it, and it just, it's a picture of righteousness coming to, to its fullness and uh, wickedness coming to its fullness. And so the body of Christ is going to be stepping more and more into a place of total righteousness before the Lord. Um, but the culture around us is going to be getting darker and darker. And, you know, that passage in Isaiah 60 says, Behold, a darkness covers the earth, and a deep darkness is over the peoples. But in that context, we're to arise and shine, for the glory of the Lord has risen upon us. Um, and then it, it, there'll be a time of judgment leading to the outpouring of God's much deserved wrath. And, and the word judgment is something that we don't tend to like. And, it, it, you know, we can, we can operate in the wrong kind of judgment um, when we get judgmental about people. Um, we're told not to judge lest we be judged. But God is the perfect one, and he has revealed himself as not only our bridegroom, he's the intimate lover of our soul, not only the king who is, uh, you know, has all power and releases his power when we operate in the kingdom of heaven, but he's also our coming judge, and every man will stand before him one day and give account for our lives. And we have two choices. We can uh, see if our righteousness cuts the mustard and um, see if we want to be judged based on how uh, we uh, leveled up, or we can have our lives accounted for based on the perfect righteousness of Christ and his blood covering our sins when we repent and uh, put our faith in his atoning work. And so um, there is a time of judgment that, that God is going to judge the nations of the earth. He's going to judge all the wicked kings. We see them working, conspiring together in Psalm 2, that they conspire against the Lord and his anointed one. And they, they say, let's throw off these shackles. They describe the word of God and the values, biblical values described in the Bible um, they they perceive them as shackles on their freedom. But if they only knew, you know, Jesus says, I am the truth, and that uh, when you put his uh, teachings into practice, the truth will set you free. True freedom is found in um, operating our lives in the way that the, 
the creator of the universe operated, uh, created us to operate um, according to his design. And so true freedom is found in loving the truth, uh, absorbing the truth, and living out the truth of the way to be truly human as described in the gospel. And so, um, you know, um, Mike Bickle had a, an experience, um, I think it was in, uh, what year was that, 1997. Um, he was reading his Bible and um, in a prayer time, and he had um, these uh, verses that popped out to him uh, in the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation. And there were verses that talked about the new name that God was revealing. And as he was reading it, he began to have this manifestation of the Spirit. He felt this wind on him and a fire on him. And um, and then a, a prophet named Terry Bennett came up to him and said, uh, the Lord is uh, revealing something about his name to you, and he's bringing to you a manifestation of his wind and his fire to confirm this. And it was, you know, very timely uh, prophetic word. He hadn't seen the passage he was reading about. And a few weeks later, he was um, reading through the book of Isaiah in Isaiah 63, and um, he came up across this passage that he didn't really know how to interpret. And it's, um, it's an interesting passage. It says, Who is this coming from Edom, from Basra, with his garment stained crimson, who is robed in splendor, striding forth in the greatness of his strength? It is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Why are your garments red, like those of one treading the winepress? And then um, God speaks and says, I have trodden the winepress alone from the nations. No one was with me. I trampled them in my anger and trod them down in my wrath. Their blood splattered my garments, and I, I stained all my clothing. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and the year of redemption has come. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled that no one gave support. So my own arm worked salvation for me, and my own wrath sustained me. I trampled the nations in my anger. In my wrath, I made them drunk and poured their blood on the ground. Now, that's an intense passage. What is going on there? But as Mike was reading this passage, meditating on it, studying, asking the Lord, what does this mean? He began to experience that same manifestation of the fire of God and the wind of God whirling around him, like physically in the natural. And that same prophet, Terry Bannett, came up to him and, and he said to him, uh, this is what the Lord says to you. You have preached the Jesus in white. Will you also preach the Jesus in red? Few are willing to preach about the Jesus in red. And um, now that reference you've preached about Jesus in white. In Song of Songs, I, I mentioned earlier how Mike had been given this heavenly mandate to preach from the Song of Songs. And it's this incredibly encouraging book about how though we're dark yet, the Lord sees us as lovely. And and uh, there's this storyline of him bringing us into maturity. And um, there's a chapter in chapter five where um, the Shulamite bride um, is being mistreated by others in the community of faith and she can't feel his presence and yet they uh the friends of the bridegroom they say why why do you love your um you know beloved so and she lands that chapter with this stunning poetic declaration of faith and praise um to her king and to to jesus really and she, she says, my, my beloved is um, fairer than 10,000. He's radiant and ready. Um, and, and it describes him in white. I'm trying to find that verse, so I'm not just paraphrasing this. Um, here in the New King James, it says, my beloved is white and ruddy. Uh, the, the NIV says radiant and ruddy. So um, the exhortation in that prophetic moment that Mike was having is that you've preached the Jesus in white, but will you preach the Jesus in red? And I've heard a lot of people try to unpack this idea. You know, we see in Revelation 19, Jesus coming on a white horse, and his his robe is is dipped in blood. And I've seen many um, who want to interpret that as that's his own blood, blood that he shed for us. But clearly in this passage in Isaiah 63, it's not his blood. It's the blood of his enemies that he's trampled in his wrath. And that's an intense picture because we, you know, have this flannel graph picture of Jesus, meek and mild, 
and he is the lamb that was slain. He comes merciful. But there is coming a point where um, those who have signed their lot to, to follow the Antichrist and have taken his mark and are wicked to the core, are, God knows, God alone knows who is redeemable and who is not. But um, when that mark rolls out, and we're not there yet, but I believe that we've seen some things setting the stage for the precursor to that. Um, that mark is going to require that we uh, willingly choose to worship the Antichrist. And when you do that, you are basically damning yourself forever because uh, and, and the temptation will be strong because you can't buy or sell without this mark. But the scriptures describe, you know, Jesus says, why do you worry about what you'll eat and what you'll wear? Don't the lilies of the flower uh, of the field get clothed with splendor? Doesn't God provide for the birds of the air? And how much more valuable are, are you? Oh, you have a little faith and then, you know, a, a little bird. Um, and so as we seek his kingdom and his righteousness, the promise is there. God will provide for us. I mean, he fed 5,000 people with two uh, loaves of bread and five fish. He can do anything, and he's going to blow our minds with miraculous provision when we trust him and don't give way to the temptation that, you know, the devil tried to tempt Jesus to turn stones into bread. And, and Jesus said, no, it's written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so um, there's coming a day when the wickedness of the planet will be so to a point where it'll take Jesus coming in his zeal and his uh, nature as a judge and a warrior, and he will confront the wicked kings of the earth. It's going to be the greatest hostile takeover the world has ever seen. Psalm 110 talks about this reality, and um, it's something that we're unfamiliar with, but um, it's something that we uh, will be offended by if we don't understand God's heart, that he will use the least severe means to reach the greatest number of people at the deepest levels of love, and he will shake everything that can be shaken in order that what cannot be shaken will remain. And, um, and there comes a point where, because God is good, he will judge uh, wickedness, and he will confront the wicked kings of the earth that are oppressing, that are sexually molesting and abusing and sex trafficking people. And, and he will bring justice. Vengeance is his, says the Lord. Um, and, you know, when we read, uh, many, many people in the body of Christ think that we're going to be whisked away by the rapture to uh, be spared from uh, these uh, terrifying times. Um, I don't believe that the scriptures actually testify about that. I see uh, that there's many martyrs on the earth and they come up out of the tribulation, um, but they don't get spared from it. I think it's going to be very much like what Moses and his generation experienced. There will be this oppressor. The, the modern-day pharaoh of our time will be very much like that old pharaoh, and he will be oppressing God's people. But God will come through with uh, miraculous deliverance. It says in Micah 17, as he showed his wonders uh, when we they um, came up out of Egypt, God again is going to show his wonders again. And, um, and so... You know, what did Moses do? He was not delivered away from this uh, oppressor. He was actually used to bring God's judgment on the oppressor, and he extended the rod. And when he did that, um, God sent his plagues on the, on the Pharaoh. And, um, and so the book of Revelation is not mostly about the horrible things that are going to happen to us. It's the horrible things that are going to happen through us on the enemies of God in the final climax of history. And, you know, Revelation 8, there's this clear connection of the prayers of the saints being um, the catalyst that releases the judgments of God on the earth. And I know we're not, you know, to um, pray imprecatory prayers on our enemies yet because we're immature. We don't um, have perfect alignment with the Lord's heart. But the day is going to come when he will bring a great deliverance and he will spare his people and be a refuge for his people, but he will um, confront the wickedness that's come to maturity on the earth. And so I know that's a heavy topic, but Jesus is our bridegroom. He's our king and our judge. And we need to uh, wrap our minds around these realities. Now, judgment isn't always um, negative. You know, he, he um, 
releases judgments on behalf of the saints. And in his judgment, his justice is when he makes wrong things right. And Luke 18, you know, we're told this parable of the persistent widow that cries out for um, justice from her um, oppressor. And the promise is, is that um, if an unrighteous judge will give justice because he's just wearied by her persistence, how much more will the righteous judge of the whole earth bring speedy justice to those who cry out to him day and night? But then he asks the question, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? That, that parable is clearly in the context, if you read before uh, Luke 17 and the, and the passage in the, uh, or, or surrounding it, it's an end of the age kind of a parable. And the kind of faith he's looking for, the kind of agreement he's looking for is agreement with his leadership night and day um, with what he wants to do. And he will bring speedy justice. Now, it's the great and the terrible day. It's not just all these negative things that are going to be happening. There are glorious things going to be happening. Um, John 17, Jesus prayed that we would be one as he and the Father are one. Now, that hasn't happened yet. We've seen little pockets of unity, and it it kind of provokes a, a watching world, but uh, we see so much division in the body of Christ. But Jesus, you know, the, James says that the prayer, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. There's none more righteous than Jesus. And Jesus is going to have his prayer answered. And there's going to be incredible unity in the body of Christ. Um, you know, it says in um, Deuteronomy 6 and uh, in the Great Commandment, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength, and love your neighbors as yourself. And um, that's not only a command, it's a prophecy. He says, you shall. It's going to come to pass that we will be wholehearted and all in. And in that day, when the persecution against the church is so intense, it's not going to be sort of a casual decision to join the body of Christ or to stay faithful to the body of Christ and identify as a follower of Jesus, um, it's going to weed out all the lukewarm believers because it's going to cost us everything. And so um, he's only going to have those who are all in. And, um, you know, he says in John 14, 12, that we would do the works that he did and even greater works than these. And uh, that is a reality that's coming friends. Uh, I I know we've seen some incredible revivalists. We've seen some people walking in the power of God. I think of Smith Wigglesworth. I think of John G. Lake. I think of, um, you know, the the healing revival of the 50s. Um, There's uh, churches that are, uh, you know, really going after this and seeing some breakthrough. But I believe across the body of Christ, we're going to see a church walking in the power of God um, because he's after us coming into maturity to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, uh, Ephesians 4.13. And the fullness of Christ is um, not cowering and saying, wow, we got to, you know, our vaccine is our only hope and, and masking and quarantining is our only hope. Jesus didn't do that in his day. He walked up and he touched lepers and he healed the sick and he raised the dead. And he said, as the father sent me, so I'm sending you. So we're going to be doing those things just like Jesus did. And it's, I, I believe, going to be one of the greatest witnesses to a watching world that there is power in the gospel. And, you know, like my coworkers going after Wicca and people are going after the new age because people are desperate for something real, something with power. And, you know, I, I talk to witch doctors in Africa and missions. Um, there's real power in that stuff. And I don't get it. You know, when, when um, Moses came and he did some miracles to uh, show that he was from God, the, the priests of the, uh, you know, other false religions, they were able to perform some counterfeit miracles as well. So somehow the, Satan can give power to do miracles but there's a greater power. Greater is he who's in us than he who's in the world. And I think the world is aching to see a church that really wraps themselves around the reality that there is power in the blood of Jesus. He went to the cross, not for our, only for our iniquities, but also for our infirmities. And by his blood and by his stripes, we are healed. And so do we believe the promises in scripture? Do we believe, James, that if we uh, the prayer of faith will bring the healing to the sick person. Do we believe that or not? That Psalm 103, um, 
uh, forget not all his benefits, that he heals all our diseases and he forgives all our sins. He says those things in the same breath. Um, I want to close um, with a uh, crazy story about um, Paul Kane. Paul Kane is uh, showed him in the video in the first uh, episode. He had a recurring vision of stadiums being filled and um, and signs and wonders breaking out all over the earth. And um, and he he was jealous that there would be um, a people who God he, that were Joel's army. Uh, people who would give themselves to the Joel II lifestyle and that these people would be instrumental in seeing the breakthrough and the release of the power of God in, in our generation. And um, now I know it's confusing because uh, there's an army described that's an evil army um, that's that's coming against um, the earth. And, um, you know, Joel chapter one describes this locust plague, which is basically the same thing as an economic crisis. And in the first portion of chapter two describes a coming, uh, looming military threat. And boy, are we ever in that hour where we see a looming military threat and the recipe for a, a, a nation in crisis is this Joel 12, um, two through 17 says this even now declares the lord return to me with all your heart with fasting and weeping and mourning rend your heart and not your garments return to the lord your god for he is gracious and compassionate slow to anger and abounding in love and he relents from sending calamity who knows he may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing grain offerings and drink offerings for the lord your god blow the trumpet in zion declare a holy fast Call a sacred assembly, gather the people, consecrate the assembly, bring the elders, gather the children from uh, nursing at the breast, let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep before the temple porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Now, um, when you blow a trumpet, it's usually a rally to war. And I, I think that's where this language of Joel's army comes from, is that, um, you know, Paul says our weapons are not carnal, um, but they're mighty for tearing down strongholds. And those weapons are, are the weapons of worship and prayer and fasting. And it's uh, God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. And, and so, you know, just like, the Battle of Jericho, it seemed foolish to the world. How can an army uh, have no weapons and just march around a, a city seven times and blow a trumpet and and then the walls come tumbling down? It's ridiculous. Well, the ways of God are not the ways of the world. And we um, decrease and he increases and we um, lean on our beloved and we come to the place at the end of our own strength and cry out for him to be our redeemer and our our um, deliverer, he will do mind blowing things, and um, and so Paul Kane, um, when he was uh, finally introduced to Mike Bickle, um, there's a crazy story about how that came to pass, but he had sensed that um, God was going to be filling stadiums and doing signs and wonders through a Joel army. And when he, uh, he was a man with incredible prophetic anointing, uh, unlike probably any we've seen in our generation. He, he knew names and addresses and phone numbers and um, just uncanny kind of stuff. But um, when he um, met Mike at his church, um, he saw this banner that said Joel's Army and Training. And he, he's never seen that anywhere in his life. Um, but... Uh, he, he had a, um, a mother who, um, kind of the background on him is that uh, his mom was very prophetic in the 20s, was a Pentecostal. It was not popular to be a Pentecostal in those days. And she was a true intercessor. And um, she had had five miscarriages and all these health issues. She had cancer in both breasts. She had tumors and, um, and she had had five miscarriages, but um, an angel came to her and said in the eighth month of this sixth pregnancy that she would have a son and, and she was to name him Paul and he would preach the gospel like Paul did. And, um, and so um, suddenly from that moment on, she came into total divine health, like got healed of all her cancer 
um, and um, had a son. And um, in his, uh, at the age of 18, I believe it was, he began to fill the largest tent in the world and, and would see um, words of knowledge and would heal people of tuberculosis and different diseases. Um, Anna Kane, for the next 60 years, never was sick once in her life. And at the age of like 104, um, she was going in and out of consciousness, kind of in a coma. And um, she had told her son that she had one final word for um, the body of Christ that was going to be her most important prophetic word ever, and it would be confirmed in her death. And then she goes into this coma, and Paul, you know, wasn't able to get this word from her. And uh, the Lord spoke to him and said, your mom's going to pass away tomorrow. So he called Mike to come and uh, be with him in the hospital in Dallas. And um, he was there, and um, suddenly after coming out of a coma, she sits up, looks at Paul, and says, Luke 4.18 is the anointing the Lord's going to put on the body of Christ worldwide before he returns. And then she goes back to sleep and unconsciousness. And eventually a few, you know, minutes later, she, um, dies and, and, um, Mike can hear the death rattle and just happened to be looking at the digital clock and knows the time of her death. And, you know, maybe 10 minutes later, the, the nurses and the doctors come in and they, they, uh, ask, you know, do you know the time of death? And, and, um, Mike just happened to know, cause he was looking at the clock and he said, oh yeah, it's, uh, 418. She died at 418. And sometime later, some people in Anaheim who had heard about this word that Anna Kane gave um, said, uh, oh, what was, you know, there was supposed to be some word that she was going to give that was going to be confirmed in her death. And and uh, and Mike goes, oh, yeah, it was Luke 418. And they go, well, what day did she die? And he goes, April 18th, 418. What time did she die? 418. I mean, you try to pinpoint the minute and the day of your death that's going to align with a message that uh, God wants to emphasize. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. But um, Luke 4.18 says this. um, It's the quote from Isaiah 61. It says, where Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And um, yeah, guys, um, there is a an anointing that's coming on the body of Christ where we are going to be walking in that same mission statement Jesus had to set captives free, to heal the brokenhearted, to open blind eyes. And both in the metaphorical sense and in the physical sense. And um, there's been many uh, recent prophetic rumblings um, at IHOP that that has led them to believe that we're entering into that season. And so um, we're getting close to, I think, a historic breakthrough where God's going to break the drought over this nation and um, raise up a company of people that have given themselves to this prayer and fasting lifestyle. And in their weakness, they're going to see the strength and the power of God released in the earth. And many are bound by their sins, and many are going to be in physical captivity. And we're going to see um, many people get delivered and healed, and um, the gospel preached in power to the nations. So it's both the great and the terrible day. You know, that, that passage in Joel goes on later to say that afterward I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men will dream, see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And all my men servants and maid servants, I, you know, it goes on to say um, there will be blood and fire and billows of smoke. And many look to Joel or Acts 2 as the fulfillment of Joel 2 and it was a partial fulfillment. But the end of that passage says that many who call on the name of the Lord, will everyone who does that will get saved before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And, um, you know, there's other passages, Zechariah 14. There's one in um, Amos, I believe, 4, maybe 5, that talk about the day of the Lord. And it's, you know, it warns us that it's going to be a day of darkness, a day of gloom and clouds and and great turmoil. Um, but in the midst of that, there's going to be... In- incredible revival and uh, the church coming into maturity and every great revival we've seen is either you know gone right before a great war 
um, you know, the first and second great awakenings prepared people for eternity before the American Revolution, before the Civil War. Um, and there were moves of God right in the midst of war. Um, and uh, revival and turmoil and tension and war go hand in hand. But it's God's mercy strategy. You know, it says where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. And so when the enemy's up to his shenanigans and gets people bound in fear and in hatred and in division and betrayal culture, there's going to be a culture that is unified. There's going to be a culture of love and sacrificially laying down their lives for the sake of the poor, for the sake of the oppressed. And we're going to see great miracle signs and wonders when paul or when bob jones uh had his heaven encounter in 75 he wanted to go in he had no desire to come back but god said uh, i'm sending you back for a billion soul harvest in the midst of this time of world war three breaking out there would be a, a billion souls that come into the kingdom and so and uh, you know there might be a billion believers on the planet right now i'm not sure uh the actual number um but there's going to be an incredible influx of the prodigals coming home and of many people coming to the Lord through a church that operates in the power of God, the humility of God, the love of God, the joy of the Lord, and the wisdom of God operating in the prophetic, like everybody in the body of Christ. Like if you're a cessationist, you don't believe the gifts of the Spirit are for today, I don't have energy to even argue with you about that. It's all in the book. But the day's coming when everyone who's been a naysayer will have their own experiences and will have to rethink their theology because that's where he's taking us, according to the scriptures. So um, I just wanted to share that context. Uh, next week, we'll, we'll jump into intercession, this idea of um, um, war happening in the earth, but God's raising up his prayer warriors because our weapons are not like the world's weapons. Um, but are mighty for tearing down strongholds. Intercession seems to be uh, something the Lord is highlighting. And intercession is uh, where we come into agreement with what God has said he's going to do. And worship is is celebrating who coming into agreement with who God is. And um, this passage in Isaiah 42 describes um, the worship and prayer movement that's, uh, you know, cropping up all over the earth um, where th they'll be singing a new song. A new song speaks of fresh prophetic songs that the Lord gives. And there's about nine times the scriptures talk about singing a new song. But it says, sing to the Lord a new song. Verse 10, Isaiah 42. Sing his praise from the ends of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that's in it. You islands and all who live in them. Let the desert and its town raise their voices. Let the settlements where Kedar lives rejoice. Let the people of Selah sing for joy. Let them shout from the mountaintops. Let them give glory to the Lord and proclaim his praise to the islands. And then verse 13, it says, in this context, the Lord will march out like a mighty man, like a warrior. He will stir up his zeal with a shout. He will raise the battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. Guys, um, our songs are powerful prayers because we choose to agree with who God is. And um, you can't see it, but behind me, there's a book uh, with some illustrations opened and it's a got a painting of Moses delivering the people through the Red Sea as it's parted. And after they came to the other side of the Red Sea, they wrote this psalm, this song in Exodus 15, and they talked about Yahweh, and they said, a warrior, he's a warrior. And um, that's a picture of Jesus that we're not familiar with, but uh, what he'll do in fullness in that day when he splits the sky and confronts the Antichrist armies. He will do in part today when we choose a posture of praise and we thank him and praise him for who he is before the breakthrough. And he comes against our enemies, the enemies of depression, the enemies of unbelief, the enemies of sickness and, and of sin and rebellion. And he triumphs over our enemies when we give up a shout of praise and we agree with him in intercession and, and invite him to break through in our circumstances. That's where he's taking us. And so um, next week, hopefully, unless the Lord gives me a redirection, we're going to be looking at this thing of intercession. Why does God call his house a house of prayer? Why not a house of 
um, you know, good deeds? Why not a house of discipleship? Why, why is this house called a house of prayer? And why is this thing of intercession so important to him? Um, in World War II, there was a company of people that rallied around a guy named Reese Howells. He wrote a book, um, or there's a book about him called Reese Howells Intercessor. And um, they saw some dramatic breakthroughs as they prayed night and day, seven to midnight, every night during World War II. And they had prayer times in the morning and in the, in the middle of the day. And they saw God changing headlines and answering their prayers as he did miracles over the Battle of Dunkirk and the Battle of Britain. And, uh, you know, when, when there was no reason why Hitler should have turned back and not taken Moscow and um, not taken Alexandria, they saw a dramatic answer to their prayers when they gave themselves to intercession. And so next week I'm going to talk about what it looks like to war on our knees. Um, and uh, so... Tune in. Thanks for joining this time. Um, hopefully you didn't get in too much discouragement over some of these dark realities of the terrible day of the Lord, but it's going to be a glorious, it's going to be the finest hour for the church. So let's get in faith around that. Let's start getting um, ready to uh, enter into those realities now so that when everything that can be shaken is shaken, we are unmovable. We're anchored in hope. We're unwavering in faith and we're rooted and grounded in the love of of the one who loves to move the sound of our voice and respond when we cry to him in prayer. And, we, and uh, so, uh, see you next week. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams your young men shall see vision. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call.